and welcome to Pick 6 Movies, the only podcast of its kind in the universe that is truly unique. You don't believe me? Well, let me tell you what makes us so ding, dang, diddly, ding, dang different. You see, each season we select six movies that are all related to one single theme. And then on each episode, we explore the people in front of and behind the camera and try to make some sense out of how and why each movie was made. And then on top of that, we give you a detailed review of the entire film start to finish to see if they're any good. You say there's other podcasts like that? Well, are they hosted by me, Chad Cooper, and my lifelong friend, Mr. Bo Ransdell? No. Uniqueness accomplished. Apologies unnecessary. And you've shown up to be part of season 10, titled Hot Wheels, where we've pulled together six movies, all featuring hot cars and fast cars and car chases and carnage and carnivals and Carson dailies. It's all about cars. And in this episode, boy, have we got a real winner for you. What movie is this episode? Right, right, right. The Fast and the Furious Tokyo Drift, a movie that's mostly set in Japan. And much like the popularity of BTS and anime and Pokemon, a lot of this film is culturally lost on me because I'm a modern day troglodyte who spends most of his time re-watching old crappy movies and then I spout off a bunch of jokes to my buddy Bo in a podcast called Pick 6 Movies. You should give it a listen when you literally have nothing else to do with your time. Hey, and speaking of Bo, let's get him in here to break down the genealogy of the Fast and the Furious franchise for those people, mostly me, who have seen almost none of the Fast and the Furious films, and they really have no idea of what's going on in this film franchise. Hey, Bo, turn on your microphone. Yeah, start start talking into the top part. No, no, the, the, the top part. No, you gotta turn it on first. Yeah, there, yeah, there you go, there you go. All right, start talking into the top part. Whoa, 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 hold on a second, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, let me turn on my electric Casio drum machine and keyboard combo. I'm gonna set the mood for this. Check this out. If you look at it a certain way, Tokyo Drift is kind of a science fiction movie. No, really. See, it was released in the year 2006, but is technically set, according to the lore of Fast and Furious movies, in 2013. There is lore in these movies, you ask? Oh, my sweet, lovely car nerds, there is lore. And spoilers. So if you don't want to know anything about the plots of the Fast and Furious movies, you may want to jump ahead to the conversation part of the show. Got it? Good. Let's begin at the beginning. After all the heavens of creation stuff, there was a director named Rob Cohen. He is the director of such films as the Sylvester Stallone Trapped in a Collapsed Tunnel movie, Daylight, and Dragon, the Bruce Lee story. He saw an article in Vibe magazine called Racer X, all about the underground street racing scene, and he naturally thought it would make a good movie. So he pitched it to producer Neil Moritz, who took it to Universal, and bada bing bada boom, you got yourself a racing picture. Paul Walker signed on to star, but Vin Diesel, thespian that he is, demanded some script changes before he signed on. In the first film, Paul Walker plays Brian O'Connor, a cop who was sent undercover to find a crew of thieves stealing electronics in audacious high-speed heists. Vin Diesel plays the head of the crew doing the heists, though Paul Walker at first accuses someone else of it because he's not a very good cop. At the end of the movie, Paul Walker, reveals himself to be a cop so he can save the lives of the crew, especially Vin Diesel, who I think he's in love with. And also, Paul Walker says he's in love with Vin Diesel's sister, Mia. But anyway, Vin Diesel murders some people and Paul Walker lets him get away because see above regarding shitty cop. Which brings us to Too Fast, Too Furious. This time, directed by John Singleton, yes, Boys in the Hood's John Singleton, this sequel was a no-brainer after the financial success of the first movie. This time, Vin Diesel bowed out so he could do The Chronicles of Riddick instead. So Tyrese, aka Tyrese Gibson, steps in as Roman Pierce, a childhood friend of Paul Walker's. They, you guessed it, go undercover to take down Cole Hauser, who is a mobster or something. The ridiculous is amped up with ejection seats, and there's a rat and bucket torture made famous on this very show, only this time done to Uncle Bobby from Sons of Anarchy. 
Ava Longoria shows up as Monica Fuentes, who is, you guessed it, undercover. This all wraps up with Tyrese and Paul Walker riding off into the sunset with a bunch of money they stole from Cole Hauser to open up a garage or something. So next up then is Tokyo Drift, but we'll get more into that in a minute, and it kind of stands a bit alone anyway. So let's hop over to Fast and Furious 4, intuitively titled Fast and Furious. And hey, what do you know? Ben Diesel is back. And so is director Justin Lin. Paul Walker is an FBI agent again somehow, and Tyrese is nowhere to be seen, so I guess none of that mattered. Vin Diesel's girlfriend, as you may recall from the first movie, is Michelle Rodriguez, but she is murdered after Vin Diesel slips out on her for a pack of smokes under the guise of keeping her safe from the worldwide manhunt that's on for him, so he goes after revenge, which places him on a collision course with Paul Walker, who is investigating a drug dealer who just so happens to be behind Michelle Rodriguez's murder. Also, Paul Walker picks up with Vin Diesel's sister Mia again, and this all wraps up with Vin Diesel going to jail, only to have Paul Walker, Mia, and some car wackos from the beginning of the movie breaking Vin Diesel out as he travels to prison by bus. Fast Five then loses some of the excess titling, and for the first time crosses the two-hour mark. I mean, what in the hell, people? But with Vin Diesel now busted out of jail, Paul Walker and Vin Diesel's sister Mia get mixed up with an old buddy, Vince, from the first movie. There's a crime boss in Rio, and one thing leads to another, and Vin Diesel and Paul Walker assemble a crew from the previous movies, including Han, Gal Gadot, the crazy Mexican guys, Tyrese, Ludacris, oh, and Mia is pregnant. So The Rock is a federal agent who is chasing them, but then lets them go and they all get rich, except for The Rock. And at the end, there's a stinger where Monica Fuentes, aka Ava Longoria, shows up to show The Rock a picture of Michelle Rodriguez, who is apparently not dead. Ugh, <sighs> how many of these are there? Oh, okay, Fast and Furious 6 then brings the gang back together at the behest of The Rock, who is now partnered with Gina Carano of The Mandalorian fame. Luke Evans plays a guy named Shaw who is after some microchip thing and has fancy cars that make other cars jump in the air. Michelle Rodriguez is retrieved and she's a good guy again after it turns out that she just had amnesia the whole time and then Gal Gadot gets killed in an airplane thing and then The Rock shows up at the end to say everyone is family and they're all clean now and then Han takes off for Tokyo where he is killed by Jason Statham that we see in a stinger uh, and Jason Statham calls Dom and says, you don't know me, but you will. And that's uh, the end of Fast and Furious 6. Okay, Furious 7 is the last film from Paul Walker, who did die tragically during the filming of the movie. It does do a nice job of holding together without one of its stars, who had done most of his shooting already. And so there was enough footage to have a nice heartfelt send-off at the end too. But what about the plot? Jason Statham, it turns out, is Luke Evans' brother and he is on a mission to kill Vin Diesel and his team, and Digimon Hansu is a warlord he's working with, and there's some kind of super hack program that a girl named Ramsey has, so they protect her while fighting Jason Statham and running cars out of the big building in Abu Dhabi, and the whole thing is exhausting. Oh, but it turns out that Michelle Rodriguez and Vin Diesel were secretly married, and they leave Paul Walker to his new life with Mia and his kids, and The Rock sits most of this one out, and Ronda Rousey shows up to fight Michelle Rodriguez, but the movie is way overstuffed and way too loud. Which brings us to the finale. This is it, folks. The Fate of the Furious. So things wrap up on our journey through these middling action films, and Paul Walker has been sent off to pasture in the story, allowed to live his life with Mia and the kids. In fact, once in the movie, somebody pipes up to say, hey, we should call Brian O'Connor, and everyone immediately tells him he's an asshole for even bringing it up. I guess he didn't know he was dead. So with few remaining double crosses to explore, Fate of the Furious brings in Charlize Theron. I mean, really, Charlize Theron is in one of these Fast and Furious movies? Yes, she is. As Cypher, a computer hacker or something, she convinces Vin Diesel to start committing crimes on her behalf and betraying his friends and family which is a big deal for Vin Diesel all through these movies about how you have to hang on to family and whatnot. So The Rock and Jason Statham fill in for Paul Walker and Vin Diesel, and they lead the team on another globetrotting adventure that culminates in chasing a nuclear submarine across ice. And it turns out Charlize Theron's blackmail leverage was Helena, who was a federal agent from Fast Five that was a side piece that Vin Diesel had when he thought Michelle Rodriguez was dead 
but she was just really suffering from amnesia and was working for Luke Evans the whole time. So, Helena had Vin Diesel's kid, and then she is conveniently killed so Michelle Rodriguez and Vin Diesel can raise this kid without pesky visitation weekends. And so, Vin Diesel and Michelle Rodriguez and the whole rest of the team live happily ever after, after they end up stopping this submarine or whatever. And even Luke Evans shows up to do kind of a babyface turn at the end. But where does our movie fit in all of this? Well, technically, Fast and Furious, Tokyo Drift, takes place somewhat concurrently with Furious 7, making it a sequel to Fast and Furious 4 through 6, and sits along Furious 7 in the canon. Who knew a franchise about lunkheads and fast cars could be so complicated? After Too Fast, Too Furious, Universal was looking to turn the franchise into a series of movies, connected more by title than by plot. With Vin Diesel being difficult about returning, it only made sense, so they started looking for new leads. Channing Tatum auditioned for this movie, which would have been about a thousand times more appealing a lead, but sadly this was not to be. Instead, Lucas Black was cast as Sean Boswell, the corn-fried American who finds himself in Tokyo amidst the drifting scene. He was the little kid from Sling Blade who liked the way that mentally handicapped murderer talked. He's also done a couple of tours on NCIS and NCIS New Orleans, which feels about right. Writer for Tokyo Drift and most of the Fast and Furious franchise following Tokyo Drift, Chris Morgan, did not think a high school based movie would work. He had initially written a sequel that included the drifting culture but had Vin Diesel heading to Japan to avenge an old friend. An old dog learning new drifting tricks to get to the bottom of a murder. Sounds pretty good, or better. But the studio responded with some notes. One, it was unlikely they were going to get Vin Diesel back, and as a result, the budget had been slashed. In fact, the studio suggested, this could be a straight-to-video affair. Morgan was passed over when the new budget prohibited his script's action and characters and plot, but a few weeks later, Universal wanted to hear about it again. They hired Morgan to do his story with Vin Diesel going to Tokyo and avenging a death. When he was done, the studio looked at the finished product and said, great, now take Vin Diesel out and set it in high school. And he did. Justin Lin, who had been in film school when the first Fast and Furious movie came out, was brought in to direct and he would become another mainstay of this franchise. Lil Bow Wow, graduating to just Bow Wow in this movie to prove he ain't so Lil anymore, shows up as Twinkie, Lucas Black's first friend in Tokyo. His other pal is Han, played by Sung Kang, who would show up in movies after this, even though he died horribly in this one. I know. Natalie Kelly is Neela, the love interest. This was her first movie, and she's been working steadily ever since. You can currently see her on Baker and the Beauty, which is almost undoubtedly a thing. Due to the constraints of actually filming in Tokyo, a lot of the drifting had to be done in Los Angeles, much in a mall parking lot dressed to look like Japan. And because Universal stunt performers didn't really know how to drift, a lot of the movie's budget went to hiring, you know, actual drifters. When the movie was released, it brought in about $24 million on its way to almost $160 million worldwide. And by the way, I prefer the Japanese title of this movie, which is Wild Speed 3. That sounds so much better. And you may be saying to yourself, Bo, if Vin Diesel was so all fired done with this franchise, why is he in this movie? Well, inquisitive listener, the truth is, Vin Diesel only appeared in this movie to get the rights back from Universal for the Riddick movies so he could make another one of those. Turns out though, nobody cared about that, so now he's doing Fast and Furious movies again. Original director Rob Cohen was less than thrilled by Tokyo Drift. After seeing the movie, he said, quote, if you were to just watch Tokyo Drift, you'd say, I never want to see anything related to Fast and Furious again. Eh, let's tuck that little chestnut away for later. Also, worth pointing out that in September of 2019, Rob Cohen was accused of sexual assault, so maybe we won't listen to him so much. But what of the movie itself? What of Fast and Furious Tokyo Drift? Is it a thrilling machine built for speed? Or is it a clunky old junker that's barely going to get you to the convenience store for that beer that only gets you back to normal? For the answer to this and more, let's bring in my old pal Chad as I present to you, ladies and gentlemen, Drifters and Street Racers, it's 2006's The Fast and the Furious Tokyo Drift.
Hey there, everybody. Welcome to episode two of season 10 of Pick 6 Movies. I, of course, am uh, Bo Ranstell, the the guy in the driver's seat for this particular episode. In my co-pilot seat, no, it's not God. It's the next best thing. It's my old pal, <laughs> Chad Cooper. How are you, sir? I'm doing good, Bo. I, I, I like that I can fit in some heresy right up front. Sure. That, that's my goal in all things. So we are, uh, we talked about the Cannonball Run. Yes. Which, as we pointed out, was in a weird way one of the, uh, like, origin movies for this show as a whole. Of like, one of these days, we are going to sit down and we are going to talk about Cannonball Run. And this, however... We never is, said that about this movie. Yeah, this is probably as far from that as, as we could go. Because neither of us are what you would call car people. No. I own a car. We, well, we own cars and, and we operate cars cars i can put gas in one i can honestly say did i lose my virginity in a car perhaps that's a story we probably shouldn't tell point being neither of us uh at least for me i've never purchased say a car magazine in my life no not for the sake of looking at cars or learning about cars <laughs> right if there happened to be a very sexy latina girl on the cover you might pick it up at the randy old age of 13 right you know, before there was the internet. Sure. In that, yes, I could see where you, you get yourself a custom truck magazine in that scenario. But no, we're talking about uh, one of the Fast and Furious movies, uh, Tokyo Drift. I felt like it was important to approach this with a, a seriousness, a level of, of, of study mm -hmm. worthy of the Fast and Furious films. And so, as a result, while I was recovering from a minor surgery and on opioids, I watched all the Fast and Furious movies, which, if you're going to watch them, that's the way. I'll take your word for that. <laughs> but I feel like I can provide uh, context and an expertise that perhaps I, I could not uh, before. That's great because I have nothing to say about this entire series of films. I've seen this movie and I saw the one where they rob a bank. Yeah, that's the the fifth one where The Rock shows up in the, in the franchise. Mm -hmm. And that is widely considered like a turning point where the movies got ridiculous to the point that they were kind of fun. Right. I also, in my brain, see Jack Sparrow being involved in this bank robbery because in one of those fourth or fifth Pirates of the Caribbean movies, they also rob a bank and drag a giant vault down the streets. So in my head, these are the same film. That's not far off. Would, would Vin Diesel be the Jack Sparrow of the Fast No, and I'm Furious just saying franchise? I see Jack Sparrow and Vin Diesel and The Rock and Hulk Hogan is there and puppets. I have no idea. I don't remember things very well. But I remember them very entertainingly. To that end, let's get started. Um, so, <laughs> the Fast and the Furious Tokyo Drift, because uh, they still had the articles the in the title at this point, right. um, begins with uh, really sort of the, the guiding principle of these movies, which is a montage of our, our hero, question mark, who in the movie is called uh, Sean Boswell. We will be referring to him as Sean Gump. Because he looks confused 90% of this movie. Yes. The other 10%, he's sleeping or blinking. <laughs> it's blinking and confused. <laughs> and, and we see him show it up to a typical day at his uh, his American university. Right. Slash prison courtyard. Slash cotton bowl tailgate VIP area. Slash monthly flea market. <laughs> right it is a wash of people he is being patted down on the other side of a metal detector along with the school mascot or just a weird guy that dresses up like a duck Yes, but it's, it's completely insane because all of these teenagers, they all just look like adults that are wandering around a high school. The mean, median, and mode ages of all these humans is 27, 28, and 26, respectively. Lucas Black, who is the, the actor behind this, was 27 at the time he filmed this. What's hilarious, Chad, is... If you, again, pay attention to the chronology of these movies as a serious student of film does, like myself, there is a scene where Lucas Black shows up in Furious 7 after uh, Han has been killed. And so okay. Vin Diesel goes to Tokyo to talk to Lucas Black and to try to get information about Han's death. 
Because they retcon who killed Han and all kinds of shit. They could have just read the newspaper or watched a TV account. They just they were just trying to get Lucas Black to pop in for a cameo. But what's okay. funny is that is supposed to happen, let's say, a couple of weeks after Han's death, which would still put him around the age of 18 in this movie. But the actor playing this is now almost fucking 40 and looks every bit of it. So it's... He's talking to Vin Diesel. He's like, hi, sir. Um, Here's some information about Han. Also, I'd like to have a conversation about my IRAs. And he hasn't improved as an actor. I will say that. Like, even in the short scene he's in with Vin Diesel, it's like, what do you know about Han? And he's like, well, you know, things just happened, I guess. It was all a blur. It was what you might call a Tokyo Drift. Does he really say that? No, but he might as well. The writing is of that that caliber. All right, here, so here I have a question for you. Yes. So you really seem to be in the weeds on this Fast and the Furious, you know, overarching interconnected story. And my the question I have for you, Bo, is in your house, do you have one of those beautiful mind walls where you have red strings connecting all of the characters to one another so that you can see the entire automotive opera that is the Fast and the Furious in front of you in one gigantic mosaic? of nonsense it started off that way but i found with a little clever editing i could summarize the entire plot of these eight movies Mm -hmm. down to a single synopsis from an episode of days of our lives (laughs) the amnesia the secret babies all of it (laughs) also in this montage chad uncomfortably a bunch of dudes are just beating the shit out of a native american effigy Mm -hmm. Well, they call it a pinata. I think effigy is much more apt. It's just like, kill the Indians. And you're like, whoa, (laughs) hang on, Tokyo Drift. What do you think was inside it? Because it looked at first you're like, oh, it's candy, but then you're like, you know what? That's narcotics. Look at this place, man. There, it's edibles. This is a California <laughs> high school. <laughs> we get to see the head jock as he's beating up this paper mache Indian, and it's none other than Zachary Ty Bryan, the eldest son, Brad Taylor, of Tim the Toolman Taylor from ABC's own Home Improvement. Uh, you might recall uh, Tim the Toolman Taylor from season, huh? And episode boom uh in which we did the santa claus (laughs) did you ever watch home improvement back in the day uh not as a rule no i mean even at that point i was kind of like this is pretty stupid i watched a lot of it and i don't remember one single episode of that show you know here's what i remember about uh home improvement more than anything and it's from the documentary about the dana carvey the failed Dana Carvey show, Mm -hmm. a documentary called too funny to fail. I highly recommend to our listeners. I do too, but it is their use of here is an ad for the Dana Carvey show. And the ad that plays right after it is like tonight on a very special home improvement. And they're just gales of laughter at how inappropriate what they were doing for that time slot was. Mm -hmm. That's what I think of when I think of home improvement. In this movie, it's filled with inappropriate things. We'll get to all of that. Hey, how about this fat kid being dragged into... And this is the next shot, people. We're not, like, skipping around. This is just the montage where Sean Gump is working on his car in Metal Shop, the the one class he goes to. (laughs) That's the one class he has. Right. They said it's this or I could stack some milk down at the grocery And they dra- a bunch of thugs drag this little fat kid from it into the bathroom. Right. And then t- drag him back out. Apparently they had his way with him in there or something. They spray paint his belly purple. Yeah. 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 With they like give him a purple spray. blurple. That's what you call that. When you spray paint a fat kid's belly purple in shop class. The purple blurple. I don't think that's right. I'm going to look that up on Urban Dictionary. Who do you think edits Urban Dictionary? It's me. That's my day job. That explains so much. I just look at everything in the real world, and then I give it a nasty definition. You're doing the Lord's work, really. (laughs) We are then introduced to a character that you think might be important, which is the girl that uh, the kid from Home Improvement is dating. Mm -hmm. But there's this whole, like, she's sitting on his convertible, like, doing her nails or some shit. She's sitting on the convertible of the Home Improvement asshole, not... Sean Gump. Classic setup, Chad. Very Romeo and Juliet. As Sean Gump walks up, she's painting her nails, and she crosses her legs, and you can see her pink underwear. Yeah. You know who else wears pink panties? Who? Not Farrah Fawcett in the Cannonball Run. 
That's true. She doesn't wear <laughs> panties at all. <laughs> Cindy sees Sean Gump and she says, nice ride. And it's here that we, the audience, for the first time get to hear Sean Gump, our hero, speak. And what comes out of his mouth is just shocking. And it's not the words. It is the accent that delivers the dialogue. Yeah. He is from Louisiana. Or no, he's from Alabama is where he's from. Oh, all right. Uh, the actor himself. Because uh, th- he uses the screen name Bama Boy later on, and it turns out that's accurate. But <laughs> was, it was his real AOL IM name? Uh huh. I like to go in the chat room sometimes and learn about people from other cultures. <laughs> like from Texas and Arkansas. <laughs> right. One time I talked to somebody all the way from New Hampshire. <laughs> She says, nice ride. And Sean Gump looks at her and he says, it does the job, Cindy. And Cindy says, what job? Delivering pizzas? And then Sean Gump says, it's not the ride, it's the rider. <laughs> oh, God, he, it, he is so... It's not it's... telling stories out of school. Like, when you were you were visiting for the holidays, and one of the first things that we did was watch this movie. <laughs> when when you stopped by. And the moment when he starts talking, I because I looked at you because I had the same reaction that you did, which is just like <laughs> jaw-dropping shock that a, a major motion picture studio would l- allow a character that spoke like this to carry a movie. The closest I've ever had to this type of response was in The Princess Bride. It was this in when Peter Cook says, Mowage. Mowage is we do people. It's like, who talks this way? Why does this guy talking like this? Is, is he trying to talk like this? Is this an accident? <laughs> About this time, the home improvement asshole comes up to play a male stereotype as an abusive shithead. And he's like, hey, are you talking to my girl? And Sean Gump says, she was just admiring my rod, that's all. And then this home improvement asshole says, my grandma's Buick could smoke that trailer trash. And Sean Gump says, how about your daddy's Viper? <laughs> Right. This is, uh, again, Fast and Furious trope here is the idea of of playing for pinks. You know, we're constantly playing for cars. So they're going to have a a, a race. Let's not forget the the self-loathing that Cindy expresses here, where a home improvement kid says, I don't I don't need your piece of shit car. What would I ever do with that thing? And then this is where Cindy Lou Who is like, hey, how about you just play for me? And you're like, ugh, what is going on at home, Cindy? You should not be behaving like this. Is she going to become one of their slaves? Apparently so. And, and Or like, you just get to fuck her? Is that the implication? Because that's what I read. And not Jonathan Taylor Thomas is like, sounds good to me, babe. I like the big crowd of adult students that are wandering around. And as I saw them, I thought, you know, the only way that this makes sense is if each and every one of them is an undercover cop that were sent back to high school to infiltrate a drug ring that doesn't exist. And they don't really know that everyone around them is also an undercover cop. Which leads to awkward conversations in the lunchroom. Like, (laughs) hey, do you know where I can get some drugs? No. No, I don't. Do you? (laughs) Do you know where I can get some drugs? (laughs) What'd you find out, McClaskey? Everyone at the school is a drug addict. Everyone's asking everyone for drugs, but there's no drugs there. It's the craziest thing. Uh, students and faculty alike, one presumes, gather around to watch these two meatheads race. Dude, they they break in to a new home build community. They cut through the chain that is, you know, securing the fence, and then they all run in. And it, it looks like the set from the finale of Lethal Weapon 3. And it's just a bunch of houses that were built up enough to where they can crash through some of them. Yeah, I think you're you're right. This whole thing looks like a really good episode episode of the A Team. Mm-hmm. So this is our first big race of the movie, and it's them, as you said, like going through houses and whipping around and shit like that. And I would say that the race sequences are competently directed. Some of them are. <laughs> There's a lot of whip pans to people shifting and shit like that. Like, how do you make an act? Uh, that is kind of innately dull you're not really doing that much you're turning a wheel and and shifting pedals and that kind of thing but how do you make that exciting and you do that by having music that is just like i'm not gonna sit here and let you degrade the dulcet tones of kid rock singing his classic song Ba 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 
As our two racing titans speed through this construction site, Bo, have some respect. You're right. Uh, Mr. Rock <laughs> deserves better. Has he replaced the stereotypical redneck image? Like, when you think redneck, is it Kid Rock now? No. Kid Rock is basically the next generation Hank Williams Jr. Oh, n- uh, maybe. Yeah. yeah. All right. I see that. <laughs> okay all right i'm more on board now for those who haven't seen this movie you've heard the setup you know where this is going and we know what you're thinking this is a traditional snobs versus slobs where our young sean gump will prove himself to be a formidable opponent to the talents of the more privileged home improvement asshole perhaps the home improvement asshole aka the snob will cheat or have some of his school chums take nefarious action to prevent our hero from leaving legally winning the race fair and square. But none of that happens because as it turns out, Sean Gump is a truly terrible driver. <laughs> yeah, to the as you put it, the dulcet tones of ba wita ba to bang a bang diggy diggy. <laughs> Sean Gump then hits just a bunch of shit. Everything, bro. Yeah. He hits everything. And sends the car flying. He crashes through a house. Could you imagine you've put down 20% in a new home build community and that that builder has to, uh, Mr. Uh, Miller? Um, Yeah, this is uh, Gary Brightright from Brightright Construction. How are you, sir? Good, good. Are you sitting down? Yeah, I'm... Um, The house that you uh, and your wife and your children are so excited about moving into in about six months. Funny story. A bunch of teenagers got in there and drove through your home in not one but two cars. In the... You mean in the garage, the unfinished garage? Oh, no. Garage. No, no, no. They drove through the dining room and the living room. A funny thing, they didn't hit your neighbor's houses at all. <laughs> Just yours. Bit like a tornado in that respect. Uh, really <laughs> something, you know? Dude, they rip around, destroying this neighborhood. And I guess they're like, what, doing a one loop? And it's the asshole home improvement kid. And in his car is the prize, Cindy. And then our hero, uh, Sean Gump, is racing around. As they're going back and forth, Sean Gump, t- he's the one who takes a shortcut because he keeps crashing into everything that's something the snob should do and then this shortcut ends with him crashing through homes and he ends up smashing into home improvement assholes car which pushes them into a like giant cement sewer pipe yeah that would kill most non-movie people to be honest this is among the tamer examples of oh this would kill a normal person I mean, by the time The Rock shows up, people are jumping out of fucking sky rises and whatnot. It's I haven't seen those movies. I'm watching this one with Sean Gump, and at the end of this, he flips his car, and it rolls over like a burrito like six or seven times. As he's flipping around, um, it kind of goes into slow motion, and you can see all the trash from inside of his car gently floating through the air, and you see a bottle of Tabasco sauce float by. Did you see that? Oh, I don't know, Chad. Was uh, It's hard to see with all the pepsi cans and kfc and shit that we'll get to in this movie yeah th- oh man this movie w- wants all your money you you got you got some shit to sell tokyo drift will help you sell it you know who carries a bottle of hot sauce in her purse at all times my aunt hillary rodham clinton oh that's right she said that no wonder remember she when lost. she was pandering to those three black morning radio hosts when she was right of her president the the thing that really tipped her her hand was when she started with ooh girl <laughs> you know i have that hot sauce in my purse is that I right like how they went to commercial when she looked at them and she said guess what my favorite fruit is and they're like we'll be right back wise that was wise <laughs> Who likes poultry? And we're going to go to another commercial. (laughs) Maybe my favorite thing in this whole movie happens next. Where we see Sean Gump and the the meathead from Home Improvement and and Cindy, the girlfriend, all sitting in the waiting room of uh, the police station. You're thinking it's a hospital. Right. Like, all of them should be on life support. They're all bruised and bloody. But th- this is the, the thing that I think is best in the whole movie, where Cindy looks over at Sean Gump, and he gives her a smile and wink, but his teeth are all covered with blood, and he just looks like shit. Also, he's not talking. They all look like extras in a Rob Zombie movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, kind of. Maybe that's why I like it. I was like, oh, boy, <laughs> if Bill Mosley shows up in this, now we got something. <laughs> They do the thing where they play back video of the movie because who was taking this video? (laughs) Somebody on their flip phone. Yeah, right. Has a widescreen shot of him 
jumping through the house and he's like, Hey, so we watched the first part of this movie, Sean Gump. <laughs> and we saw you drive right the fuck through this house. What do you have to say for yourself? And he's like, I'd really like a copy of that tape if you don't mind. The, the cop says to him, you're done, Sean Gump. You're done. He's like, you know what? All before your 18th birthday. So at this point, Sean Gump's mother comes in um, because the rich kids got off scot-free because they're rich kids. Mama Gump is played by Shannon Sarandon, sister and stunt double to Susan Sarandon. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> she could also be Sarah Moore standing in for julianne Moore, sure <laughs> squint your eyes and she's all of them and she's dressed like peggy bundy yeah and she just comes in and she's like oh well what happened to my boy and he's like look he's an asshole i mean look you look like an asshole too because she immediately starts smoking in the police station which is always a good move the only way you can get away with that is if you are also going to uncross your legs and show your pussy oh my god does that work for you it's worked at least twice <laughs> the cop says he's lucky if he doesn't get tried as an adult meaning that he's clearly an adult and he'll be lucky if the judge is stupid enough to think he's <laughs> under the age of 40 and clearly mentally disabled sean gump got a, a fake id to prove he was underage <laughs> i don't like the taste of alcohol so i just try to take it off the table entirely <laughs> Mama Gump says, this is our third town in two years. And then Mama Gump looks at the officer and says, officer, there's got to be another way. And then we cut to Mama Gump and the cop and uh, they're fucking in the bedroom while Sean Gump sits outside listening. Wait, that's another movie. No, wait, it isn't. Because in this movie, the cop comes out of an interrogation room followed by Mama Gump. And then Sean Gump, I guess, is off the hook. There you go. He just goes, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> your mama sure does love you yeah <laughs> you're going to tokyo boy <laughs> and and so that's what happens they work it out so that they, they're like if you can somehow get him out of this fucking country we'll consider dropping the charges oh my god and she's like i got i got just the plan so she's <laughs> gonna send her kid to go live with her uh his father in tokyo Bo, he can't speak english let alone Japanese. She's not trying to set him up for success here. Th this is two birds with one stone for her because she clearly has a lifestyle that involves a lot of drinking and smoking. Right. And he probably interferes with that, much like he his interferes dad. with his father's plans for much the same. <laughs> of drinking and smoking and indiscriminately fucking people. Yeah. Oh, my God, man. He, his father is so good. Anyway, we get uh, yet another montage as he arrives in Tokyo where we get uh, ads for KFC and McDonald's. And we're seeing the big bright lights of, of Tokyo and all the, the neon advertising and so forth. Sean Gump shows up and has a guitar strapped to his back. Does he ever play it? No. Yeah. I think this was all a bunch of guerrilla filmmaking like they did in that jackass movie you know where johnny knoxville and wee man put on those panda costumes and dry hump those people that were just making their way through downtown whatever city show up at this drunk's house and say you're his son that's what happens it's not even a house dude it's a storage unit slash apartment like again this is very japan japan has limited space and you know a shit ton of people and so all the houses are real compact yeah sean gump shows up at this teeny tiny little box of a place to sleep and and he buzzes the doorbell and uh, Papa Gump shows up and he was like, hey, I thought you were going to be here on the 7th. And then Sean Gump says, oh, today is the 7th. And I don't know where this movie starts off. Like, is it Los Angeles? Are we in Birmingham? Bug tussle? For the sake of math, let's say we're in Southern California. Yeah. And we're looking at a 17 hour difference between there and Tokyo. And when, if Sean Gump leaves on the 6th, he would arrive on the 7th. So maybe he's right and today is the 7th. But more likely Sean Gump left on the 7th and now it's the 8th. Hence his father's confusion. However, if I lived in Tokyo and my son was coming to visit and he didn't show up on the expected date, you know what I'd do? I'd call Mama Gump to find out where my son is and get more details on when to expect him. You know what I wouldn't do, Bo? I wouldn't hire a Tokyo prostitute to come over and have sex with me while my son is lost in the labyrinth of international airports around the world. But that's what Papa Gump does. Yeah, you you and he lead very different lives. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, he just decides to have a few, get it wet, and then... And when when Sean Gump shows up on his doorstep, he like you say, he's like, huh? Yeah, we're a day ahead. I guess I just forgot or something. Anyway, come on in. <laughs> he says to the prostitute as she leaves, "Domo origato." <laughs> that means thank you very much for your vagina. <laughs> Oh, it's, it's not the first whore this guy's had sex with in his lifetime. Oh, of course not. It's not the first whore he's had sex with this week. <laughs> <laughs> I've only known one person who's ever paid a prostitute for sex. 
I, th- I I think that's right. I'm I'm trying to think if I knew anyone else, but I know the one person you know. Yeah, he had sex with a lot of different whores. Yeah, he had sex with a prostitute in the shed outside his parents' house. That's crazy. He had sex with a whore at a massage parlor and was so drunk and couldn't finish that he had a designated driver who was waiting outside for him and take him to another massage parlor where he finished up having sex with a different prostitute. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess it just goes to show, you You know, you, you're into what you're into. I guess. And the, I the first massage parlor just wasn't cutting it. He got his first blowjob from a prostitute when he was 16 and he came and told me about it. And I, my mind was blown. I'd never heard of anything like this in my life. And then he went back up two weeks later to get another blowjob and it turns out that the first person who gave him a blowjob who was a black woman um he wanted to get a blowjob from a white lady and she wanted twice as much money and then the white lady told him that the black lady wasn't a lady but was actually a man and he confronted the black lady and realized it was a man and he didn't do anything violent he just drove away in shame and came and told me that story he told me never to tell anybody but i've told that story literally hundreds of times it was one of the greatest things i'd ever heard in my life it's a hard story not to tell (laughs) i mean for as punchlines go (laughs) baby that ain't a woman is right up there that's a man yeah (laughs) yes that story is tremendous i don't know in today's enlightened age would it be so bad i don't know yeah you know what yes yes it would maybe not Eh. i don't know let's get back to papa gump having sex with his own prostitute Um, off the prostitute goes to deal with her bad life decisions and uh uh, papa gump tells sean gump hey come into inside my storage unit and uh we can kind of deal with my own personal bad life decisions And once inside, Papa Gump offers his son, Sean Gump, a place to sleep, which is this tiny cot in this even tinier closet. And these accommodations are worse than what Harry Potter had when he was under those stairs. Right. Well, at least Harry Potter didn't have a window that looked out an alley. And by alley, I mean eight inches across the the opening to a weird noodle lady. Yeah, she's eating that lo mein. Yeah, she's going after it, like watching some crazy <laughs> Japanese game show. And she couldn't be happier to see Lucas Black when he shows up in, in the window. <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, the, the rules of the house are pretty simple. His father is like, you are going to go to school and then you're going to come the fuck home. And that's what you're going to do mm-hmm. until I can trust you to do something else. And under no circumstances are you to ever touch a, a, an automobile. Right. Okay. So this will all work out. And the end. And that's the next day. Yeah. And Sean Gump wakes up to an alarm clock and he finds a uniform waiting for him and a note that says, train to school leaves at 0700. Mm-hmm. Let me tell you what I'd do if I'm Sean Gump. Number one, I'm not putting on any uniform and I'm not going to get on any train to someplace that passes for a school. Number two... I'm going to probably call up that prostitute because I know her number's uh, stuck on a post-it note somewhere in the house and maybe get an Asia Pacific blowjob. And number three, <laughs> I'm making friends with the old lady next door who was stuffing her face with all that delicious lo mein and heading over there to watch Japanese game shows. That all sounds great. Doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Instead, what he does is he launches about the impossible for him task of taking a train to school. And again, does not read or write a lick of Japanese. No. And is now forced to navigate their subway system. He has the intelligence of a jellyfish, man. He has somehow has somehow ventured into the realm of negative charisma and presence. Where in any given scene, you're actively put off by him. He shows up at this school and his teacher is speaking Japanese because we're in Japan. And Sean Gump says, I'm new here. My name is Sean, Sean Gump. And this lady's just prattling off in her native tongue and he just looks terribly confused. And as this teacher is chattering away at him, Sean Gump somehow figures out because she's pointing and pushing him out of the classroom that he has to swap out his shoes. But none of this is really explained to him or us, the audience. Right. He just says Wabaki a bunch. (laughs) And then shows up with new shoes or slippers. I don't think he realizes that he's in Japan. I think that he is in a tight-knit community right outside San Francisco. Right. He's getting villaged. (laughs) Everybody talks so different here. I think they're doing it on purpose. He thinks he's in Star Wars or something. Yeah. This is the most Isley Cantina for him. (laughs) Everybody looks so different and they talk in a different language. I think I might be on another planet. 
Sean Gump goes down to the cafeteria to eat what is comparatively unusual food. And here we get to meet Twinkie, who is a young man played by Shad Moss, a.k.a. Lil Bow Wow. You mentioned him in the intro. I remember him from the non-Bugs Bunny Michael Jordan movie, Like Mike. Some of you may remember him from Scary Movie 5 or Medea's Big Happy Family, or more than likely, you don't remember him from any of these things. Or as a sort of rapper for a know. while uh you know not impressive but anyway he has little bow wow he sits down at the cafeteria table and he says um yo japanese cafeteria food is like the army don't ask don't tell and sean gump looks at him and has no idea what any of these words mean i recognize that you are a person who has said something could you repeat that maybe slower he's just jamming his mouth full of sushi and whatever else is in this bento box of surprises like he's jethro bodine he's just well as the the old saying goes he can't eat and comprehend at the same time (laughs) little bow says i see you ain't got no laptop i'll hook you up half price and sean gump is so confused by all of these words it's like i think he's just in shock of maybe seeing the only black person in this school on his very first day there because there were none in the school he was in previously. No. <laughs> like if they ran them off. If you're a black guy and you go in and there's first giant metal detectors, then you walk in and you see a bunch of white guys beating a Native American effigy and screaming and laughing about it. Dude, I'm turning on my heels and I'm getting the hell out of there. Right. You found yourself at Trump <laughs> University is where you got yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm majoring in wall building. Sean Gump says, uh, no, nah, man, uh, I'm cool. I don't think I need one of those uh, computers, as you called it. And then Lil Bow Wow says, oh, seeing as you're an army brat, I'll give you 60% off. And Sean Gump says, hey, I'm not in the army and I don't have any money. And then Lil Bow Wow offers him a cell phone. And you're like, oh, okay, so this guy's a hustler. He just yes. sells a bunch of stuff. He's like Red and Shawshank, only less important to the movie structure, the protagonist character arc. He's incidental to the narration of the film and he's basically non-essential to anything that happens in the movie so he's nothing like red yeah i'm a man who is known to get things once in a while but nothing (laughs) of importance nothing of value um (laughs) he's like hey you got a car and he's like yeah i got a car so they go to the parking garage and there's sort of a Ferris wheel scenario where you like you, you put your ticket in a slot and it wheels your car around. Again, everything is lack of space in Japan. So how do you stack shit? And it turns out that what Bow Wow's vehicle of choice is, is a green Turan. That's a minivan, Bo. <laughs> yeah, kind of decked out. It's a decked out minivan. That's what little Bow Wow drives. Right. but A green minivan. But it looks like the Hulk. It looks like the Hulk was inside it and tried to get out because there's a giant footprint mashing out from the inside on the back door. You know, the one that you open to put in soccer balls and groceries and that sort of thing. Yeah. And then on the side of the doors are fist punches from the Hulk. And there's Hulk eyebrows on the front and a Hulk face painted on the, the hood. Yeah. The only way I think this works is if you call your junk the Hulk. You're talking about his, he calls his dick the Hulk? Yeah. Good God. Right? Because it's big and green? Like, dude, you need to see a doctor. No, because it's powerful and try to get out of his car like that. <laughs> I don't I'm stretching, man. There's just so little to hang on to in this movie. <laughs> Nothing makes any sense. I think it turns out that the director of the movie was a big fan of the old TV show, The Hulk. And there was an agreement with Universal to do a bit of a tie in there to make the Hulk front and center before we moved into an era where you could make you know, real deal Hulk and superhero movies. So. Yeah, maybe. So. Anyway, uh, first of all, holy shit, Chad, the sheer presumption of Sean Gump in this scene, because mm-hmm. they get like, they back the Hulk van out of the slot and immediately uh, Sean Gump is like, I'm driving your car. I know it's your car and all, but I'm just going to take your keys now because I'm white. Bullshit. It, Dude, I don't like people driving my car and right. I don't give a shit about my car. But th- that's exactly what happens. And Bow Wow is just like, cool, man. It's like, no. <laughs> for, like, why would this guy who has known Sean Gump for all of 12 minutes be like, please take my car and drive it around in one of the busiest cities in the world and see how you do? 
These two idiots make their way over to this multi-tier parking garage where there are all of these souped up fancy street racing cars. And it's filled with a bunch of gearheads and a bunch of anime cosplay aficionados. All the women in this place look like they're on their way to the audition for the live action Sailor Moon movie. <laughs> there, <laughs> there's a point where Bow Wow even hands Sean Gump a box of tissues and is like, for when you blow your load, man. And you're like, Ugh. If I met somebody and I'm in their car and he has a box of tissues and he tells me that those are for when you ejaculate, I'm never talking to that guy again. I'm not touching him. Like, he's dead to me. Man, we went to high school with a dude who was he was ahead of us. But he got busted jerking off in parked in a Kroger's parking lot and he was ruined forever. <laughs> Like, that became the one thing everyone knew about him. Yeah, you get something like that. If people know that you drive around in your car and masturbate, um, I mean, that's you're that guy forever. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you are the guy who jerks off in his car 100%. And speaking of... <laughs> Neela shows up who is uh we we saw her briefly in the classroom scene just laughing at Sean Gump appropriately right and she pulls up in a car of her own and Sean Gump then approaches her to take a look at her car seats taken so <laughs> he goes over and just proceeds to say the dumbest shit mm -hmm. possible where he's just like so Y'all race with these? These are cute little toys and all. Am I minimizing your culture enough? Do I seem smarter now by diminishing you? And she's like, hey, listen, asshole. First of all, you don't know what the fuck shoes are in this country. So back off. He's like, you mean Wabaki? And she's like, yeah, that's what I mean. <laughs> and then she ironically says, you're a quick learner. And he's like, thank you. He asks her, where are you from? And she says, here. And then Sean Gump says, no, not where you live. Where did you come from? And I was thinking, he might be asking how babies are. No, I mean, I've been asking my father and my mother, but they are too drunk to respond. <laughs> I've I've asked so many people this, and no, everyone thinks I'm joking. The best I got is someone asked me, do you know what fucking is? And I said, yes. And they said, that's it. But I don't know what that is. I just said I knew what it was because I wanted them to like me. Do you like me? <laughs> Would you like to fuck? Wait, where are you going? <laughs> oh, <laughs> stupid, stupid Sean. I keep telling myself, don't t ask people that when you first meet them. I don't know why, but they don't like it. We cut across this nightclub parking lot garage. And here we meet two new characters, DK and Han. Bo, right. how would you describe these two characters to people that should never see this movie? All right, so DK has oily hair and is in a leather jacket, and he's kind of the low-level Yakuza dude of this movie. Han, he's our bad guy. He's our bad guy. And then Han is much more easy breezy. He's got a little cowboy bebop in him. Mm, and, he's asian brad pitt yeah he's real he's all smiles he's real charming and which is the reason like everybody in this movie got left behind except for han who went on to star in other movies of this franchise <laughs> they, the one character that they killed is the one character that comes yeah, back that that's kind of why i love how dumb this franchise's lore is <laughs> it's like if you brought quit back for a jaws sequel <laughs> I mean, we'll get to it, but like at the scene where Han is killed, they changed that twice in, over the course of the franchise. It's Wait, beautiful. What? Yeah. So in this movie, you know, Han is ultimately killed by the machinations. Fire and explosions? Yeah, but DK is the one behind it. it what? In the later movies, that changes two times who is behind Han's death. It's just a car that runs into him. So they paid someone to run into it? Yes. And yeah. anyway, right. ultimately, what you need to know is ultimately Jason Statham killed Han. I, I'm never going to watch any of these, but that's okay. DK thinks that Neela is his girlfriend. It's a real Karate Kid situation where she's like, we're not really together. And he's like, whatever, babe, you're my girl. And Han is like, 
you know, he's just playing it cool. He's hanging back, watching Dude, to see how things work He's got two fly out. honeys on each arm, and he's got three more waiting in the wings. Yeah, Han is the, the player of this movie and does really dumb shit, as we will see. When Sean Gump is talking with Neela, DK sees this, and he doesn't like, because you said, you know, he feels like that they're a couple. And so DK is making his way over to beat Sean Gump's ass, and Lil Bow Wow sees this, so he scampers over to intervene. DK approaches Sean Gump, and he puts puts his arm around Neela and then DK speaks to Sean Gump in Japanese because that's where our movie is set and Sean Gump looks at him and he says I'm sorry I don't speak Japanese and then DK calls him Gaijin which just means foreigner I'm sure there's a little additional I I think the connotation yeah I mean the direct translation is just foreigner but I think it's meant to be derogatory fair enough but Sean Gump doesn't take it that way he's just like Gaijin what does that mean exactly and DK tells Sean Gump he says why don't you you turn around and keep walking and he's speaking in english you know for the audience and and obviously for sean gump and then sean gump says that's funny because i thought this was like a free country where a girl could talk to whoever she wants and i'm like look this is not a case of individual or nationalistic freedom this is a case of interpersonal relationships and there is zero chance that sean gump has any idea that japan is a free country or not he's just again assuming that he might be in the united states still Yeah, he thinks he's in Chinatown. (laughs) DK says, you know who I am, boy? And again, he's speaking English. And Sean Gump says, yeah, you're the Justin Timberlake of Japan. And I was like, is that an insult? Justin Timberlake is a quintuplet threat. Yeah. He sings, he dances, he acts, he does comedy. He's an entrepreneur, writer, director, producer. That's a compliment, Bo. If somebody called me the Justin Timberlake of anything, I'd be over the moon. Right. It means that you do everything better than just about everyone else yeah if you're the justin timberlake of baking you do wedding cakes donuts those crazy fondant halloween cakes biscuits edible weed cookies sexy dick shape cakes you do it all if i were the justin timberlake of edible weed cookies <laughs> trying to imagine what that would look like and all i can come up with is heaven in the background of this east meets wet standoff we see han and Han's constantly popping food in his mouth. He does this throughout the entire film. And we've discussed on this show before uh, sort of the, the the trope of having a character casually tossing food into their mouth as a juxtaposition against more tense foreground circumstances. And I would like to see more characters casually eating while watching very intense situations in other movies as they find entertainment um, while others deal with stress and conflict. Like, I'd like to see a child eating cereal while parents scream about an impending divorce. Yes. I would like to see someone on the beach snacking on popcorn while a lifeguard performs life-saving CPR. Uh-huh. I want to see a cop eating raisins while another cop diffuses a bomb. I want to see someone eat cashews during a hostage negotiation. I want to see someone popping jelly beans in their mouth one at a time during a federal execution. <laughs> I want to see someone snacking on animal crackers while removing a loved one from life support. I find all of that to be potential delightful juxtaposition. I was thinking of trying to sneak in like a really messy candy apple, but that seems like you you take away the casual nature of the snack there. Han stands up and says, hey, let's ride. And DK walks off. But before Sean Gump says, good luck, Timberlake. And I'm thinking, does this lunkhead think he's referring to him as Justin Bieber and not Justin Timberlake? That would make sense for the character, although there is no way to telegraph that to the audience. (laughs) Other than just to be like, he is really stupid. (laughs) I mean, he doesn't do anything smart in this movie ever. So... (laughs) Yeah, I, but it, it feels very on brand for Sean Gump. DK comes back and says, let's have a race. And Sean Gump says, yeah, let's race, me and you. But there's a problem. Sean Gump has no car. And it's here that Han just tosses a pair of keys over to Sean Gump and says, he can race my car. Let's see what he's got. Now, Bo, in a better movie, mm-hmm. we would see a race where our young upstart, Sean Gump, would race against the more experienced DK and he would lose. But during the race, we, the audience, would see some signs of him being a good driver if only he had someone to take him under his wing and train him yes that is not what happens in our movie no so they first of all they take an elevator up or down it's hard to tell it's gotta be down yeah i guess so because they race up uh to to get to the ground floor of of, of floor of this place so they can race and while uh they're in the elevator sean gump is like hey why did they call him dk and bow wow says 
it's uh it's for drift king i thought it was for donkey kong that's a joke you know what it's not a joke i think he he literally thinks that dk stands for donkey kong i thought he was really good at it and could get past the stage with the girders you mean the first one sean gup wait there's a different stage past that one I watched The King of Kong, and I thought it was all fiction. But it's Drift King uh, is what DK stands for. And then Sean Gum says, what's a drifting? Have you ever played Mario Kart, you simpleton? Even at this time. <laughs> you know, in a pre-Tokyo Drift world. But yeah, have you ever played a racing game ever? And he's into cars. Yeah, yeah. I only drive cars one direction, not sideways. <laughs> So they, they get to the, the bottom of the elevator and they come out and he sees an example of drifting uh, as two cars drift by. And Bow Wow is like, hey, do you still need a dictionary? What is a dictionary? Is that how you drift? If it'll help me drift, yes. Anyway, so Bow Wow takes him to his car and is like, here, just kind of ride the emergency brake. That's what you need to know. And he's like, all right, I, I think I got it. He doesn't. No, 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 no. We see Sean Gump watching Neela and DK a little bit, being a little flirty. Han, of course, still snacking, smile on his face. And now we are off to the races. As you pointed out, it doesn't go so well for Sean Gump. It is as though Sean Gump has never driven a car before in his life. Yeah, it's a lot of just running into barricades and walls and shit. It's a, it's a real mess. Meanwhile, DK, of course, is an expert at this and um, reaches the top and people celebrate and pull around. Han, of course, has lost a car now, but does not seem particularly upset by this. No. Maybe slightly disappointed, but not by much. I just want to say, Sean Gump smashes his car into everything. Like concrete support beams, walls, other people's cars. That was cars S plural. He almost runs into people if they didn't jump out of the way. It's like putting a chimpanzee in an automobile. It is embarrassingly bad driving. Forget the drifting. I'm just talking about turning corners. Yeah, he, he would have done better not drifting at all and just driving sean though does bring the car all the way to the finish line albeit totally busted up the only way this would be more embarrassing though is if when he got to the top he was masturbating and he had that hanging over his head as well <laughs> right like hey didn't i see you in the, the grocery store parking lot a few decades ago that was me now i'm not gonna be known as the guy who masturbates in grocery store parking lots i'm gonna be the guy who masturbates in souped up street racers that's better right wherever i was going i was masturbating it's terrible <laughs> you know he drags this busted car to the finish line and han is the first to greet him there and he leans in and he just says don't leave town that's on Han, man. You just threw a stranger your keys and he destroys it? That's you, dude. Look, I, I'm pro Han in this movie. I like the fact that he's just like, I'm going to fuck with this kid and say some menacing shit. Meanwhile, I'm totally on board. Right. And when you say kid, you mean 36-year-old guy who has really failed to plan for his financial future. Right. Right. And so Sean Gump goes home and who should be waiting for him? Drunk. But Papa Gump. And he's like, hey, do you know, do you know what time it is? You smell like burning tire rubber and crushed metal. You've been racing? You're out of here. You have nowhere else to go except jail. Also, it looks like you've been looking at cosplay girls. I can tell because I ordered <laughs> one earlier. Papa Gump says, you live under my storage shed roof rules. You live by my storage shed roof rules. No racing. You can only piss in the bucket. Don't poop in that bucket. And you hang a sock outside if you are going to have a prostitute in here. I think that became my Christian Grey. <laughs> it kind of did, yeah. It evolved. <laughs> but in a, in a weird way, isn't that what he's doing? <laughs> Without any money, power, or real direction in his life, sure. It is the low-rent Christian Grey of Tokyo. <laughs> hey, maybe, maybe you'd like to be tied up and smacked in the ass and stuff. How about that? <laughs> I've got more money. <laughs> Sean Gump agrees to all these rules, so now it's the next day. And on his way to school, Sean Gump sees Han sitting on a different 100% less mangled car outside the school. Sean Gump says, uh, hey, uh, Han, I'll get you the money I owe you for destroying your nice automobile. And Han says, yeah, I know. You have no choice. Get in the car. Yeah. So off Han and Sean Gump go, where they stop at a men's bathhouse, where Han tells Sean Gump to go inside the bathhouse and get some money from a guy that uh, owes it to Han. 
And Han says, the guy has a paw. And Sean Gump says, a paw? And that's it. Let us not overlook how hilarious it is when he goes, a paw? It is yeah. it is one of the top five worst deliveries of the movie. That was a that was the best take. Yeah, it was, <laughs> that's as good as it got and never got that good again. But yeah, so he is now forced to go in and collect some money on Han's behalf. He doesn't know who this guy is. Nope. Or what he looks like, doesn't know his name, doesn't have any physical attributes other than he's got a paw. Yes. And he doesn't speak Japanese. Right. So he just puts on a towel. Strips naked, puts on a towel. Yeah. And goes marching into this bathroom Mm -hmm. whereupon he sees a rather large gentleman uh, of a sumo wrestler variety fatter than a sumo wrestler with a giant bear on his back gotta be your guy notably a paw on his shoulder yeah it's a big bear yes tattoo yes we got to talk about this guy's nipples sean gump's nipples yeah he's got a really hairy chest but his nipples are 100 percent hair free it looks like they've been shaved so that the nipples are exposed and they're really bright red and slightly oversized yes you can't not notice them it's an odd nipple arrangement well then we get another set of nipples when the fat guy stands up and he's got these giant undulating pendulous breasts the camera just pauses on him it feels like some sort of early 80s spring break movie where it's just boobies in a movie but in this case it's just male flesh and nipple makes you forget about sean gump's pepperonis a little earlier yeah i expect to see that guy come waltzing out of papa gump's place later in the movie <laughs> special order <laughs> earning 10 bucks the hard uh-huh. um, so the big guy gets up and then we cut to sean gump being thrown out of the male bathhouse by the big fat guy and sean gump is now fully clothed so did this massive big breasted man afford sean gump the courtesy of getting dressed before throwing him out on his ass in the street it's a fine question or in midair he just for decency's sake as he was being tossed out the window he somehow snagged his clothes and put them on as best he could while in midair the fact that sean gump doesn't have his socks on the outside of his shoes is a miracle in every single shot of this movie (laughs) yeah that's true but yeah so he gets tossed out on his well-dressed ass Mm -hmm. and then the giant dude comes barreling out As Han just kind of sits leaning against his car for all of this. Mm -hmm. Snacking on some Cracker Jacks. Yep, and Sean Gump gets up like he's going to rush back inside, but the the dude comes out and tosses Han his money. Is this for, like, drugs or gambling? Do we ever know? We don't know. It's just, you know, Han's collecting. That's all we know. All right. So once he's he's got his money, he tosses the keys to uh, Sean Gump who has proven now that he can drive by being a punching dummy and is like, hey, get in the car, let's go. And Han then kind of gives the deal to uh, Sean Gump, which is, hey, you're working for me now. You are are in the pickup and delivery business. And no matter what time it is, no matter if it's day or night, you get a call from me. You do what I tell you to do. That was the same business that Burt Reynolds and Dom DeLuise were in in the Cannonball Run. They were a delivery service. Land, air, and sea. And Mm -hmm. Sean Gump is the much dumber version of that without as much (laughs) air and sea. Once he kind of lays down what Sean Gump's new career is going to be, he takes him to visit DK and his stooges at the back of some store. Mm -hmm. And it's a back room where they're all playing like Mahjong or something. This is where like DK gets another round with Sean Gump. And Han's like, hey, you know, he's paying me back for destroying that car. Don't sweat it. Uh, He's good. And DK's like, yeah, I hope he's not driving. He's an asshole. And then another one of DK's dudes calls him a gaijin as well. This is where Lucas Black or uh, Sean Gump is like, well, there's only one way to settle this. And that's in a race. I can race. And they're like, look, you dumbass. You just did this terribly. Are you saying you want (laughs) to you want to race me? So Han then puts up the, what, the uh, 72 Skyline, he says, as bait for this. And Han's like, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll back my boy here. His boy being Sean Gump, you know, we'll settle it on on the streets of Tokyo like men. 
Mm -hmm. Then there's a bit of business on the back end of this where DK is like, hey, Han, your shipment's late. When is the shipment coming in? Han, when is the shipment coming in? Han's like, it's cool, baby. Don't worry about it. And immediately you're like, oh, well, this is just going to get him murdered. Like, th that's who this character is. He is the likable guy that's going to get Sean Gump into this world only to be killed for being a little too casual about things like when the shipment's coming in. Yeah, and they dismiss Sean Gump. They're like, hey, you need to go outside. We got some business to talk about. And Sean Gump goes over to a payphone and makes a call to his dad. And he calls him up and he's like, hey, dad, it's me, your son, Sean, Sean Gump. I had to stay <laughs> late at school for extracurricular activities like running and ping pong and shrimping. And that's all I have to say about that. Goodbye, dad. It's me, Sean Gump, your son. You know... <laughs> Yeah, God. His father is like, <laughs> he sees the incoming call and is like, well, I could answer that or I could drink the rest of this beer. I think I know where I'm headed. So Sean Gump hangs up the phone and who comes walking along but Neela. And Sean Gump says, stop following me, Neela. Your mobster boyfriend might get suspicious. At that point, Han comes out and then Neela goes inside and off Han and Sean Gump go to handle more of their uh, money collecting business. And while they ride, Han explains that DK's uncle is Yakuza and he's a mob boss who takes half of whatever anybody makes on his turf. And then there's a bunch of other chatter about why they raise which really amounts to nothing yeah there's always uh again uh, being a bit of a student of these films chad there is always a moment <laughs> that's you yes oh, you're the one where th somebody philosophizes about the beauty of racing or how you mm -hmm. know just everything goes away and it's just me and that quarter mile you know that's a real vin diesel thing you live in life a quarter mile at a time but han also kind of reveals here like the reason i'm kind of keeping you around one dk hates you and that's kind of good for me also uh you you still owe me for that car right and we also get a little tidbit here where they run past some cops after sean gump hit some some nitrous mm -hmm. you know i want to go really fast Han tells him, like, hey, if you're going more than 180 kilometers an hour, as Doc Brown made famous, then mm -hmm. you they won't even try to chase you because they're factory issue cars and they can't keep up with you. Sean Gump is like, I think I'm beginning to like this place. And you're like, oh, God. <laughs> They go to this back alley party that's filled with a bunch of models. And it looks like that same DJ from the parking garage is there. And Lil Bow Wow shows up and all the women start pawing at uh, Sean Gump. And then Han says, leave him alone, ladies. He's underage, which is code for he doesn't have any cocaine. <laughs> and Han, Han leads Sean Gump to this secret room behind the secret secret room, which enters into this sprawling garage filled with tricked out streetcars and portable sleeping crates they're all being occupied by these models and i'm thinking are these models really prostitutes and i think han is involved in human trafficking uh i don't know that that's off the table here uh you know han's got his fingers in a lot of pies <laughs> is that what he calls his girls yes his pies i think that there's a b plot to this movie that is grossly overlooked dealing with han and his model prostitutes and their sleep tubes in his garage <laughs> so uh in in the midst <laughs> of the, i mean you're you're not wrong there is there is work to be done by several like interpol related agencies so han also tells him hey that red evo in in the stall next to you uh, is your car now that's you're gonna learn how to drift and he's like that sounds great but should we do a montage maybe and han's like that's a great idea sean gump and so sure enough we have a montage of uh sean gump learning how to drift and they're doing it at like this dock where bow wow is watching along with han and uh, there are two fishermen they're they're kind of the statler and waldorf of this mm -hmm. movie yep where they just pipe up occasionally and they're like you call that drifting he looks like an asshole right it's just this little party where everyone's hanging out having some beers and, and chit-chatting while this dude's learning how to drift race or whatever i think it's adorable you say that he's learning how to drift race because all he's doing is smashing up another car <laughs> yeah he still is not good at it Sean Gump wanders his way back to his father's storage shed home. And Sean Gump sees his father working on the frame of a muscle car. And it's a real, hey, dad, I didn't know you like cars. 
I like cars too. We're not too different, you and I. And then you're like, ah, this scene don't matter. Let's just move on. <laughs> yeah, because his father does not matter at all in this movie. <laughs> well, there's one scene where he prevents his son from getting shot in the head. But other than that, doesn't really matter. Yeah, yeah. Lil Bow Wow could have pulled the gun as opposed to his pops and he would have been just fine. Speaking of Lil Bow Wow, back at school, he's getting his ass kicked by one of DK's henchmen because Lil Bow Wow sold the henchman a faulty iPod. Yes. <laughs> Look, this was a knockoff iPod at best. Mm-hmm. So this doesn't work. He And uh, Sean Gump intervenes. Yeah, he steps in to keep his friend from getting beat up. And then Sean Gump just gives his iPod over to the henchman. He's like, what is this all about? You want an iPod? I can give you mine. It's got a lot of good songs on it already. It's got ABCs. It's got Mary Had a Little Lamb and Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. Those are my three favorite songs. Also, the collected works of Rafi. He helps me go to sleep sometimes or to turn out the light when I get scared. After he gives his iPod to this dude who seems satisfied by this, he's like, all right, I got a working iPod now, even though it's loaded up with songs that make me think that you might be a serial killer. Songs that that regularly encourage you to clap along. (laughs) Yes, any iPod loaded with music where at least 50% ask for audience participation (laughs) is either the iPod of a child or a murderer <laughs> or, Sean, or sean gump or sean gump who fits somewhere uncomfortably in between <laughs> and so bow wow is real pissed off at this because he's like hey man i've got a very strict no returns policy which you have just undermined and not since the opening scene of the phantom menace when trade wars were discussed was i so disinterested in company policies in a movie i'm like hey isn't this movie supposed to be about drift racing and instead i'm hearing about the personal return policies of bow wow during this scene neil is there and she's watching all this go down and then she smiles because sean gump has stepped in to help out his friend so she sees that he's not a complete idiot or if he is an idiot he's at least a benevolent one i think the term you're looking for is useful idiot (laughs) <laughs> that's 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 a good one wait that's what that means yeah hold on a minute <laughs> we cut to little bow wow playing soccer up on this rooftop building at night while han and sean gump look on from above and it's here that han tells sean gump that he's like a cowboy that made a run for the border and tokyo is his mexico and sean gump says why did you let me wreck your car you know that i cannot drive and han's like look i'm rich i don't care i want honor and loyalty from all those that are around me and uh, i'm like hey you should run for president and then han tries to get all philosophical about life how it's simple and it's about choices and you think all this is gonna matter but it don't i mean han is in this movie for about another 15 minutes (laughs) but yeah there's a lot of business about like all these people why do you drift if you don't drift to win (laughs) well he's looking at all these people and he's like look at them just walking around like ants marching like dave matthews said they do look like ants from up here. Would they look like ants if I went down there? I'm going to just pretend I didn't hear that to make my point, which is you got to do things even if you're scared of doing them. Oh, I get scared sometimes and I listen to my iPod. I lost it the other day. I don't know what I did with it. Justin, is that a cut? I think that's a cut. Then we get more training sequences with Sean Gump failing to learn to drift. And then Sean Gump and Lil Bow Wow, they just start walking around Tokyo selling giant clocks that people wear around their necks, like Flava Flav. Hey, did I ever tell you my my Flava Flav story? (laughs) No. I was working at Planet Hollywood in Houston, Texas. Picture it, late 90s. This is pre-Foofy Foofy Flava of Love. It was pre the Surreal World or whatever that show was called. This is Cold Lampin' with the Flava flavor flavor yeah 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 so flavor flavor rolls into planet hollywood with a friend and these two women it's like on a wednesday afternoon at two o'clock and they eat a bunch of food and they drink a bunch of drink and then they go to pay the bill and the managers there always had the discretion as to comp the bill for celebrities or not and this manager didn't know who flavor flavor was also flavor flavor had the clock he, he looked like flavor flavor and then the manager came in and he was like hey look i'll comp their food but i'm not going to comp their booze so the server gave him the bill and nobody at the table 
people had any means of paying for anything at all. And so the server comes out and is like, hey, they don't have any money. The manager is like, what? He's like, yeah, they, they said they don't have any money. He's like, well, go back and ask them if they have a check. And one of the ladies at the table had some temporary checks that she had received from opening a new checking account earlier that day. And the manager just finally acquiesced and said, you know what? I'll pay for all their food. And that's my Flavor Flav story. Back to this movie. Just to, because I don't want to skip over this. The the move that Han has when he and Sean Gump are out driving, where he does the drift around the car of sexy ladies, to the point that he like impresses them so much with his drifting that they just stick a note with the, their phone number, or I guess one of their phone number maybe, out the mm-hmm. window, and he drifts by and grabs it from her and it is the smoothest shit if you are into drifting that you will ever see yeah he's gonna take that phone number and call those ladies and then eventually have sex with one or both of them either individually or at the same time right and then they will eventually find themselves far far away from home be heroined <laughs> right like it, in one of his sleep tubes yeah it is having sex with papa gump or maybe that fat guy from the bathhouse it, it's the plot of taken essentially only with han (laughs) in the villain role we then cut to sean gump and lil bow wow walking around tokyo and they're selling these giant clocks uh to the citizens of the city that you would wear around your neck like flavor flav lil bow wow says man i'm so good i could sell rubbers to a monk yeah you could tell them they're party balloons i suppose but i i think even monks like they have the internet they know what condoms look like i guess so it's because monks are celibate so yeah i don't know maybe he's good salesman we then see sean gump getting the hang of drifting because we've now gone through like four montages usually you get the hang of drifting after two montages here we're about four (laughs) he's whipping around this warehouse district on the crooked streets of mountains up above and he's really getting the hang of it and then back at papa gump's storage shed he goes in and he notices that sean gump has not been sleeping in his closet cot and so we come back to han's garage and sean gump shows up looking for a place to stay and why did sean gump leave his father's storage house with all of its stench of piss bucket and neighbor noodles cooking i i think the implication is this is so poorly edited slash written i think the implication is he went home and his father booted him out for not being home i guess i don't know either that or he just decided on his own. they don't really explain it no it, it's yeah it's odd yeah so next we see sean gump racing against dk's henchman the one that was mentioned earlier right and they're gonna do the same zipty doodle up to the top of the garage that we saw at the start of the film when dk handed sean gump's ass to him in the car that sean gump destroyed yeah but this time sean gump i know what drifting is <laughs> he's actually good at drifting now And so he ends up winning, and the dyed hair flunky of DK is clearly distraught. Like, he is beside himself. Mm -hmm. He does an impression of the comic strip Kathy as he cries. Yes. Ugh. He's, like, squirting it out. We're old. Man, speaking of old. Then we cut to Sean Gump in school. Mm -hmm. And he's apparently getting the hang of things by not paying attention. Right. And instead, it, while the teacher is, uh, is is teaching a lesson about, you know, here's how you can understand Japanese, he sends a message somehow to Neela with his screen name, Bama Boy, right. which is, how come I never see you drift? And it is, I, letter C, letter U, which I know that's how people text, <laughs> but ugh. No, that's how he spells. That's right. That is just his familiarity with the alphabet. So Sean Gump and Neela go on a date and Sean Gump says to her, this food ain't that bad. I didn't even have to put ketchup on it. And Neela tells Sean Gump, yeah, well, when I was 10, my mom died. And so DK's grandmother took me in when I was a kid. And I'm like, wait a minute, you were raised by DK's grandma? This is some straight up Dickens or Shelley type shit, man. Their brother, sister, kind of, lovers, sort of. She's a child. He's an adult. She's my daughter. She's my sister. She's my daughter. (laughs) 
Sean Gump says, my mom and dad split up when I was three and my mom and I moved around a lot, mostly because of me. I'm like, what kind of trouble does a kid get into that requires his whole family to move from one city to the next? Clearly his entire family has been on the grift for some time. I guess. I mean, look at the mother. Maybe she was the one who really caused them to move and she just blamed him. Like, he, you know, he knocks over a glass of milk. Oh, that's it. We got to move to a new city. Come on, Shawnee boy. Pack up your stuff. Yeah. Another midnight move. That, that's why you're not educated. Sorry about that, Sean Gum, but we couldn't keep you in a school long enough for you to learn anything. It's all right. I like being able to smell my letters. Sean Gump and uh, Neela, they go up into the mountains and Neela shows Sean Gump how she can drift. And we get this long sequence of the two of them riding around with like four or five other cars. And there's this moonlit choreographed automotive ballet where they all drift around the turns of these mountain roads. And it's all elegantly done. It it would be a nice scene if Sean Gump weren't just such a wet blanket on the affairs because as he and Neela are talking and she's like yeah you know we used to skip school and come up here and you know just drift and let the world you know again the typical fast and furious racing as philosophy kind of shit they're talking about they did this when they first got their driver's license yes Let's assume the age that you get your driver's license is 16. And these two idiots are still in high school. Let's be kind and say they're both 18. So she's being nostalgic about something that happened last year? He is too. He's like, I'll tell you, the day I got my driver's license was the happiest day of my life. And then the day after that, I won my first race. I beat some rich kid by three links and I couldn't have been happier. And you're just like, yeah, that happened what, last Thursday? I think he's referring to the opening scene with that home improvement asshole. Maybe so. Maybe like the scene we didn't see is him getting his license the day before. We have seen the entire <laughs> racing career of one Sean Gump. <laughs> we cut to the next day. Uh, Sean Gump is hanging out at Han's place and then DK shows up with all of his henchmen and then DK just starts beating the hell out of Sean Gump and nobody at the garage steps in to help out Sean Gump and then DK says, hey, stay away from Neela and he says, Han, you need a new driver in that scene. So we cut back to school and Neela sees that Sean Gump is all beat up so neela goes to dk who is in his office with two prostitutes yes clearly okay and she's like dk it's over and i'm like what's over your brother and sister now aren't you yeah and he does the dark side trick of like we're not so different you and i neela I don't know why you want to be away from me when you and I are really just two sides of the same coin. And he tells her that her mom was a prostitute. You're like, wait, what? We're moving to Victor Hugo territory here, Bo. The best trick in Kabukicho, he says. And yeah, and she's like, you leave my mother out of this. And he's like, you know, if we hadn't taken you in, you'd be a whore just like her doing. And he says you would do anything for a buck. Are you kidding me? And she kind of gives him some shit right back where she's like hey if it weren't for your uncle you wouldn't be anything like your uncle is the one who has the power you're not shit (laughs) and then he grabs her real close like and repeats like we're the same neela the difference is i know who i am and where i belong this movie is so full of stupid dialogue like that that feels like it should matter and that it should make sense and neither of those things are true it's like they just copy and pasted dialogue from another script and just plopped it in there it's real dumb but again these movies are just kind of chock-a-block full of that shit it's real soap opera e and and sure enough neela washes up on han's place again got a place for me to stay right and he's just like hey motherfuckers this grocery bill ain't going down (laughs) the more of you that show up and want to drink all my beer like hey look han wants to have a good time as much as anybody but how about we handle shit But anyway, of course she can stay there. They got a whore tube she can sleep in, you know? Let me tell you about your new career, (laughs) Neela. Or at least your new career as soon as Sean Gump stops showing you any interest in you. That's dark. That's a little dark. Back at DK's place, his uncle, the Godfather, shows up. But how do I know he's the Godfather? Because he's wearing a white suit and a white fedora and a white vest and a white tie and he's got a cane. He looks just like the Godfather in 
What was that other movie? Every other movie? Yeah, that was the one I was thinking about. He is dressed exactly like the dude at the beginning of Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom who has the antidote. Mm -hmm. He looks exactly like him. Except in this case, it's, uh, of course, Sonny Chiba. And he is, you know, asking to look at DK's books. And, you know, he's like, you know, I look over this stuff and I just wonder... How are you so fucking stupid, DK? DK's like, oh? Mm -hmm. And he's like, how can you not tell that you are getting ripped off by this dude, Han? And DK is like, oh, well, it couldn't have been much. And Sonny Chiba, as the godfather, is like, you know, there's an old saying, for want of a nail, the horseshoe was lost. For want of a horseshoe, the steed was lost. For want of a steed, the message was not delivered. And for want of an undelivered message, the war was lost. And DK is like, um... What was time again? Yeah. What is the lesson here? The, should I have a horse? Do I need a nail? Are we at... Are you... What war are you talking... Is this... Are you talking about Iwo Jima? <laughs> Grandpa? Uncle? Once again, DK is shamed and humiliated by his uncle Kamada, and he is feeling especially hurt by this. And so we know that bad shit is about to go down. Yeah, let's get to it. Yeah. DK and his crew show up at Han's garage. DK gets out and everybody thinks that DK's there to get Neela back. But instead, DK goes over and just starts beating up Han. Then Neela appears. That makes things worse. So DK pulls a gun on Han, which is surprisingly the first gun you see in this movie. So Lil Bow Wow runs off. And I was thinking, maybe he's going to go get those magic Michael Jordan sneakers. But he doesn't. He just causes a distraction by smacking one of the garage doors doors to close and then han runs off and everybody gets away and they all jump in their cars and we get a big race sequence yes again this is kind of where the, the movie sort of shines there's some good wrecking here of some just good old-fashioned cars hitting shit that i i quite enjoy I found this race sequence kind of boring and repetitive. It was all race, race, gear shift, whip, whip, zip, zoom, squeal, speedometer, side swipe, near miss, tachometer. Yeah, it goes on for a little too long, but you've got like the thing where DK flips his car around and is shooting at Han through the window in reverse. There's a big pile up after that. And there, so there's some, I would argue, cool shit that happens in this sequence. There's some terribly irresponsible shit that happens in this sequence. I'm specifically specifically citing the fact that Sean Gump as Neela sits shotgun in his car decides to drive through a crowded intersection of Tokyo. This place looks like Times Square on New Year's Eve. There is not room for people to move and this dumb dumb just decides he's going to drift through this sea of people. What ultimately happens is as they're like racing through these crowded city streets, Han gets T-boned which sends his car flying into the intersection. It flips over. Sean Gump sees that he's alive inside the car, mm -hmm. but there's oil or there's fuel leaking and there's also a fire uh, under the hood. And then as he starts to approach to help Han, uh, it explodes. Big ball of fire. Everything blows up. And then fucking Neela and Sean Gump beat feet. They were just like, hey, we don't want to get here when 5-0 shows up. No. Also, Bo, T-boned over on Urban Dictionary, one of my finer entries. That is the one that I break out around the holidays to <laughs> read to the kids. Neela and Sean Gump head to Papa Gump's storage shed house. Right. But before Papa Gump can get off his prostitute and answer the door, uh, DK shows up and he pulls his gun on Sean Gump, but then click, click Papa Gump is there, emerging from the shadows with his own gun, aiming it at DK and then Neela says it's okay it's okay I'll go with DK so DK and Neela they take off and Papa Gump looks at his son and says Sean Gump you're getting on a plane tonight I'm your father and I'm drunk and I'm responsible for you and it's here that Sean Gump says I'm responsible for my mess daddy did you watch the news tonight and hear about that fatal car crash downtown that was because of me I did that I am not a good driver I get hurt. I hurt people with my driving and I cannot see too good. I have cataracts and my hands are numb a lot and it's hard for me to hold the wheel when I drive. I think I'm colorblind and I cannot read. I have no sense of direction and it confuses me the way gravity works. 
How I got my driver's license is beyond me. Mom took the instructor into the back room for half an hour, and the next thing you know, I have a driver's license. <laughs> the case that he makes to his father, because you're right, his father is like, you need to get the fuck on a plane. You need to get out of here. Look, you're really bringing my whole vibe down. I gotta be honest with you. <laughs> Wheels confuse me. I don't understand how they roll. Why don't they have edges? How does that work? He tells him, like, this, this is my mess. I need to clean it up. Maybe you can understand that. And that's kind of all he says. That's all he has to say about that? It, yeah, the, yeah. Papa Gump looks at him, like, meaningfully for a second, and then just kind of slowly nods, like, I think I understand you now. It's like, what are you doing? He didn't say anything in defense of what's happened. No. He caps it off by saying, at least you're not redoing my mistakes. Yeah. What does that mean? <laughs> I'm interested in your dad's mistakes. If they're more grandiose than your fuck-ups. At least you're not drunk when you said it. <laughs> Sean Gump goes to see Lil Bow Wow. And Sean Gump says he's going to go see the Godfather to end all this. And Lil Bow Wow gives Sean Gump a backpack filled with cash that belonged to Han. Right. Don't ask. I, I guess. And the idea is like, okay, well, if Han was skimming, let's clear the air. I'll just give the, the disco Godfather... So this money and the air is clear right. and there is an hilarious moment where unironically sean gump as he's talking to bow wow whose name is twinkie in this movie says man i just don't know sometimes twink look i'm only a man <laughs> and somebody a man referring to another smaller man as twink it makes me laugh well, you're not watching the right online videos. I see that all the time. I, you're probably right. <laughs> so yeah, Bow Wow has this backpack of money that he stashed in his Hulk car. And off Sean Gump goes through a bunch of Yakuza thugs on his mm -hmm. way to talk to the Disco Godfather. And he is allowed in once some of the older heavies are like, well, he's got a backpack full of money. Maybe he, he's good for something. Right. No, you let him in, you shoot him, you take the money, and you throw his body in a dumpster. That's right. <laughs> it's easy math. DK sees him enter and is just like, the fuck? What is this guy doing here? Mm -hmm. Gets all up in his face. And Uncle Kamada is like, hey, can it remember when i was telling you earlier about what a piece of shit you are that so sit down and shut up sean gump says your nephew and i have embarrassed ourselves something fierce i have a peaceful solution a race dk and i mess things up pretty fierce we should have a race and the loser leaves town for good yeah it's an old school wrestling loser leaves town match <laughs> this is so stupid yeah it oh man again I can't tell you how delightfully surprised I was by how dumb this movie is. Even in the context of this Ding Dong movie, this moment feels completely ridiculous. It would be like, I mean, truly, if he said, like, we should have a thumb wrestling match. Like, what are you talking about? And you leave town? It, it's the same reason that you saved the rec center by having the big ski race. All it right. is that shit. It is no better and no worse. It just feels like it ought to be better in a movie like this. Mm -hmm. But it's not. It's just it, like we're going to have a stupid race to uh, determine the fate of your nephew who may get right. banned from Tokyo. So if he shows up, what, you're going to kill him? At this point, the Godfather pulls out a gun and shoots Sean Gump in the head and the credits roll. They split up the back pack of money and <laughs> order some delivery. They get whores and gin and they just spend the rest of their evening getting high and getting laid. Yeah. That's not what happens. The Godfather says, hey, that sounds like a great idea. Let's have a race. <laughs> right. So then the the kids all go to the rec center, a.k.a. the Hans, Hans garage. Yeah. It's taped up with do not cross police tape. This is a crime scene from an investigation. Remember when there were dead bodies burning in downtown Tokyo? And this group of ding-dongs just sort of do -si do their way in there. And they're like, we need to get a car. And all the cars are gone because the cops took them. But in the back alley, there's that first car that he destroyed that has some pieces and parts. So Sean Gubb gets a bright idea and he goes back to see his dad. And the car that his dad is working on, they're going to marry these two together and create a a souped up Ford Mustang that our hero Sean Gump can race against our enemy DK. Yes. East meets West mm -hmm. and in the battles for all times, you know, he takes his new kind of muscle car out for a test spin, but uh, he fucks it all up. And because he's not a very good driver, <laughs> what? 
and just continually spins out for a while. <laughs> Bow Wow looks at a meter and then they screwdrive some stuff. I mean, it's all stuff that's like, I guess they're tuning the car and bit making it perfect bit. or one way or another getting better. Every single scene, we're going to fix this car. Then we're going to race. Oh no, he crashed. Will we be able to save the day? And it, Straight up ends with Bow Wow wiping the hood with a rag as they all stand back and look at this car that looks like it has been professionally restored by one of those like <laughs> reality show garages, you know? <laughs> I envision Sean Gump climbing into the driver's seat and it's like Michael Keaton and gung ho. Like it just immediately falls backwards and the wheels pop off. In a better movie, that's what would happen. <laughs> but so then we go to the digital nightmare that is the last 15 minutes of this movie. I'm so glad you said that because the first race sequence is pretty good. It looks like real cars doing real stuff. The finale of this looks like the Wolfman. It's just awful. I guess the reason is we want to do all this whipping into cars and whipping out of cars and all that stuff as, as we're shooting the scene, but it just looks just like this big blue blurry mess. It's at night. Yes. You can't tell which car is which. You don't know who's ahead or behind. It's all in the shadows. It almost feels like they didn't have the budget to really do it upright. So it's like, yeah, we'll just hide all that. Well, and we're like going into cell phones and looking at that video. And we, you and I had this discussion at the time, which was, so how are people keeping up with this race? They try to fudge that by showing individuals like strategically placed along this winding path they're going down but then all of their flip phones are connected to one another so they can watch it from one it 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 just stop it it doesn't make any sense it does not make any sense uh, and i don't know that it does much in the way of like visual flourish either it, it, it seems like kind of a bad idea so dk and sean gump are now head to head drift racing around this mountain banging into one another like it is the height of excitement for this movie yeah it's about a drift squeal screech bang <laughs> it's not suspenseful at all the cannonball run had a more edge of your seat sense of of anxiety around who could actually win that race i I, you know what? I don't think that's wrong. I, I think you're right. <laughs> there, There is less certainty of who's going to win the cannonball run. There's one scene in this movie where the camera is sort of tracking each car and the camera is representing Sean Gump's car and the camera goes over the edge of a cliff and it's implied that Sean Gump in his car is going to die, but that's not the case. It's a real head fake, but not in a good way. It's kind of that like, hey, what's that on your shirt? Gotcha. <laughs> DK ultimately, like he's, he's doing a little rub in his racing business, mm -hmm. ends up going all over one of the embankments. So he flips his car down, but as it falls, it almost hits Sean Gump's car. But he gets around it, and then he wins like two seconds later. I guess. Neela runs over to Sean Gump, and so she's Team Sean Gump now. The Godfather, who's been there watching this, is he just at the finish line? Like, they're at the top of the mountain. I'll wait here and see who comes across yeah. first. Yeah, I'm not going to do all this bullshit of trying to follow this race or be there when it starts. I, the only thing I care about is who wins. The Godfather comes over to Sean Gump, and he says, you're free to go, which is code for, I'm going to murder you and your family and all of your friends. I'm going to burn down your house all the houses around your house i want everyone to know who runs this town there is no way you are going to live to see the sun come up in the morning i want him dead i want his family dead i want his house burned to the ground <laughs> we got back to the parking garage nightclub strip club from the very beginning of this movie and little bow wow comes over to sean gump and he says hey somebody wants to race you <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh boy this is a real capper yeah so sean gump is is flirting with neela bow well says yeah this guy said han was family and sean gump then gets in his car and pulls up beside none other than one vincent diesel mm -hmm. um i don't know if that's his real name how is he in movies i don't know man how did he for showing up in this thing get the rights to a franchise I don't know. But I guess because they were like, oh, who, no one's going to see this fucking Riddick shit. Uh, give him whatever. <laughs> Tell him he can have 
Clifford too. They pull up beside each other and they flirt a little bit about, you know, American muscle and shit. And Sean Gump is like, you know, this isn't just some 10 second race. And Vin Diesel says, I got nothing but time, kid. And then they race and they just take off. We don't like see the outcome of the race or anything. We just see the fact that Vin Diesel is uh, putting his stamp of Fast and Furious approval on this movie of just like, hey, that's it, kids. Hope everyone had a good time. And then you get a little closing dialogue that's like, hey, assholes who watch this movie. Remember, these are all stunt people. Don't try to do this with your cars, dipshits. Duh. An end of movie. This movie is just head scratchingly odd it's a real weirdo of a movie like it's got to say a challenging main character is underselling it like lucas black i'm sure is a fine person but he is not a very good actor and him carrying this movie on his back is just a thing that doesn't really happen now you mentioned channing tatum tried out for this role he would have been really good in it he might have been too big for this movie maybe not at the time but he would have been fine. he would have been fucking great but yeah it is the worst in the grand scheme of things because i've seen all these fast and furious movies now i don't think it's the worst of those but it really it, then what is ah uh, man that eighth one is real bad that last one where charlie's theron shows up uh-huh. that's a real stinkeroo worse than this yes i'm gonna take your word for that because it's about 40 minutes longer and way less interesting Ugh. yeah yeah i don't know where, where, where do you come down on this like it, would you ever recommend this to someone no of course i would not <laughs> i wouldn't recommend any of the movies we discuss on this show to anybody ever not really we watch garbage that's what we do yeah you can't make fun of good movies you and i've accidentally stepped on a good movie you know superstar was one we liked We're like what are we doing watching this we should be watching crap yeah this is an entertaining film <laughs> We watched Home Alone. You know, even then we were kind of pointing out the notes that weren't played as opposed to the ones that were. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I no, I think you're right. Yeah, but this movie in particular is uh, is kind of a bummer. It's almost a, you should watch the first like 20 minutes of it because then you'll know everything you need to know about this movie and uh, dare I say it, this franchise. Mm -hmm. But just for the, the bonkers belief that Lucas Black was somehow going to be a star. And, and seeing him in this movie, especially that first race sequence, like watch this movie up to the point he gets sent to Tokyo and it's, that's all you need to see. Yeah. You don't need to see anything. Else yeah. You know what you should do after you do oh, that? What? You should go and watch the original Gone in 60 Seconds circa 1974, which is the inspiration for episode three of this season hot wheels mm -hmm. because that movie is incredibly good filled with thoroughly irresponsible filmmaking but not the kind that we've discussed in this episode it's really good irresponsible filmmaking then after you watch that you can go watch the remake with angelina jolie and nicholas cage and a whole bunch of other people because that's what's coming up on the next episode the remake of gone in 60 seconds I can't wait. That sounds uh, delightful. Have you done your homework and watched the original book? I've I've started the original. I didn't get all the way through it. I fell asleep. You got well. You know what? All you need to really watch in the original is the last forty minutes. Now I know for those of you who haven't seen it, and when you turn it on, you're going to think, "Is this a porno?" And the answer is no. But it should have been. But when you watch a forty-minute long car chase sequence that is completely void of any sense of human safety or or public responsibility as it comes to filmmaking it doesn't get any better i tell you what gets a lot worse is the remake and that's what we'll be talking about yeah that's not a very good movie that's see that's what we do here yeah you're right you're right i just every now and again i i look over the horizon to see the the valley beyond filled with good movies running free and i think boy it'd be fun to be there every now and again that's not where we swim we're over here in the dirty part of the pool yeah the filthy stench ridden cinematic sludge that's us the filters don't work and uh people are, are pissing off the diving board in the area that we like to splash around in so come back and see us in two weeks time as always like rate review send us a comment send us an email pick six movies at gmail.com tell a friend as we continue this season hot wheels with six movies all inspired by automotive fast racing high speed um shenanigans sure that's what you could call it if you want or shit I'd prefer that. Yeah, that's probably more accurate. Two weeks, we'll be back. We'll be back.